Operation Clean Sweep still active as all escapees must be caught. Farmer clubbed to death with a third police hot on 35 old suspect trail. Benjai's alleged assailant granted $50,000 bail. Guyana preparing for ICJ to settle Venezuela border controversy. Those were the top headlines for the week ending September 15. Welcome to MTV's News Updates Week in Review. I'm Sandy Ramutar. Good afternoon. To starting off, we tell you that an intelligence-based operation is ongoing to apprehend wanted fugitives Rodin Williams, Cabinia Stevens, and Paul Garaya. Williams managed to evade the joint services during a confrontation two weeks ago when his colleague Yuri Verswak was shot and killed during that operation in Linden. Here's Nikhil Jondu. The operation is ongoing as we speak. We said it's intel. We said it's intel driven, and uh, we have a policy in place. Uh, as soon as we get some development, you'll be the first to know. Like we always in cooperate with what we're doing in the Guyana Police Force. Assistant Commissioner Operations Clifton Higgins says, Operation Clean Sweep is active. He noted that the operation is intelligence based. Hicken pointed out that prison escapee writer Mark Williams, also known as Smalley may or may not have left the mining town of Linden. The assistant commissioner, who has responsibilities for operations, says they are working diligently to apprehend the escapee. You have, you have a pass in Linden. Was, was, was in, was, um, well, the exchange was in Linden, and he was with Vasek. We now rule out the possibility that he's still in Linden, and we now rule out the possibility that, that, that he's not in Linden. So, Intel driven, and we have our um, operational pastures throughout the length and breadth of the country, just in case. The police are still hunting for escapees Corbina Stevens, who also escaped from the Georgetown prison during the fiery riot, and Paul Garaya, one of the 13 inmates, who borrowed his way out of the Lozignan holding facility. Eleven of the inmates have since been caught and placed back into the prison system, while one was shot dead. Cam Street Prison escapee Yuri Varswick was also shot and killed during a confrontation with Joint Services in Linden two weeks ago. During the operation, the prison escapee used his tactical skills to shield Smalley, who eventually eluded ranks of the Joint Services. The Ghana Police Force has offered a $10 million reward for information leading to the arrest of the escapees. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Following the recent murder of a 49-year-old farmer, Mini Shavir, the police are in hot pursuit of a 30-year-old suspect who was last seen in the company of the man moments before he was murdered. Shavir was hammered to death with a torch whilst imbibing alcohol at a hong shop in South Ripununi, Region 8. Lashana Gomes Krenis filed this report. According to the police, while not releasing the identity of the suspect, they have vital information which will soon lead to the man's arrest. Commander Ravindra Nath Budram, Senior Superintendent of F Division via a telephone interview, related several statements from a few individuals are being taken by the police. We got statements, I can't see whether they see exactly what happened, but we got statements. So just that that person would have got in contact with this man and assaulted him. We think to do post Martin probably tomorrow. So I think we have work out that caused the, the, the fight between them. According to initial police reports, on the day of his demise, Javier was last seen alive in the company of the suspect. They were both observed imbibing alcohol at a local hangout in the village. An argument subsequently ensued which led the suspect to arm himself with a flashlight and allegedly dealt the victim several blows to the head and the body. Many Javier subsequently died from his injuries. As the police's investigation continues, the hunt for the man responsible for Javier's death remains paramount. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Colonel Elias. Still on the police blather, the legion work of the force bearing fruit not only in apprehending the prison escapees but in decreasing crime. This is evident by an 11% decrease in serious crimes while 89 illegal firearms were seized. Nikhil John filed this report. In its monthly missive to the media, at the end of August 2017, there has been an 11% decrease in serious crimes when compared to the same period last year. In the five categories of murders, there has been 39 disorderly, 15 domestic, 
12 during robberies, 4 execution, 8 unknown, and 2 others, bringing the total to 80. The police say murder has decreased by 18%, a 16% decrease in robbery on the arms, where firearms were used was also recorded. Also, robbery on the arms where instruments other than firearms has decreased by 5% and robbery with violence has increased by 41%. There has also been a 20% increase in robbery with aggravation and 27% increase in larceny from the person. In addition, rape has decreased by 6%, while there was an 8% decrease in burglary and a 19% decrease in break and enter and larceny where no instruments were used. The force has also seized 8 to 9 firearms for the corresponding period when compared to 53 last year. With regards to traffic management, there was a 24% reduction in fatal accidents at the end of August. The Guyana Police Force noted that speeding and inattentiveness are the two leading causes of fatal accidents. In addition, driving under the influence of alcohol and failure to confirm the sign and pedestrian crossing in the path of approaching vehicle. The force has attributed the ongoing operations countrywide by the joint services, which have resulted in the reduction of serious crimes and accidents. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. As disasters are coming in the Rupununi, a location has already been in mark in Latim for a disaster risk center to store disaster relief supplies. Centers are expected to be constructed in each administrative region following the completion of the one in Latham. The Upper Takatua Presukebo region has been placed at the forefront to have a disaster risk center. Land has already been earmarked for the center, with construction expected to commence early next year, said Chairman of the region, Brian Alicock, when contacted by News Update. Well, we need supplies and so and a monitoring unit, because we don't have them for that as well. I think that in 2018 budget, um, we'll be able to get something to work on that. The region has been selected to house the forest center, given its constant severe dry and wet seasons over the years. Earlier this year, the region was plagued with an extreme drought for months, which saw huge losses of crops and livestock. Meanwhile, three weeks ago, the overtoppling of the Iring and Rio Branco River in Brazil had caused flooding in a number of villages. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. City Hall is still cash strapped and is looking at the government for a subvention. However, for that to be possible, according to the Minister of Communities, Ronald Bolkan, a proper plan must be presented to demonstrate clearly how it will be spent if granted by the government. Yannis Abrams filed this report. In wake of owing the two major solid waste contractors, Sivan's Waste Management and Poron Brothers Incorporated, over $300 million, City Hall is requesting government assistance. However, in order to obtain such subvention, City Hall must present a detailed plan of the use of the subvention, said Minister of Communities, Ronald Bulkan. I cannot present a request to the Cabinet in the absence of uh, a proper plan and program to show where these, um, sub where these subventions will end and at what stage our councils and the Georgetown Council will be able to um, have its own sources of revenue to be self-sustaining. Bulkin said that the request has raised the issue of how revenues are being collected. According to the minister, his ministry is currently looking at long-term solutions to remedy the financial needs of the municipalities. The minister said that the valuation system must be reformed. So currently, um, what that leads to is inequity inequity in the revenue burden, that there are a lot of prop properties that are highly valued that are not captured uh, in an equitable and a fair manner to pay their fair share of rates and therefore the burden is disproportionate and it also results in inadequate revenue. City Hall has constantly been complaining about not having enough revenue to evacuate their functions. Due to the May and City Council owing Seaborn's waste management over $194 million, the solid waste company took a decision to dismiss 40 employees on September 1. In December 2016, 
City Hall requested $600,000 from the government to ensure workers are paid for the Christmas season. However, that sum was never given to the council. Reporting for MTV's News Updates, I am Yanis Abrams. As the second phase of the Kitty Seawall roundabout continues, the Junior Minister of Public Infrastructure declares that the entire project will be completed before the year ends. Here's more. The Kitty Seawall roundabout is moving apace and is expected to be completed before the end of the year, says Minister within the Ministry of Public Infrastructure, Annette Ferguson. According to the Minister, the first phase has been successful which saw the covering up of the exposed sinkhole. The hole advanced after a galvanized pipe burst near the seawall on Vicinion Road last December. However, works are ongoing on the southern half to between Carfesta Avenue and Vicinion Road, which will see the construction of substructures. Those structures are to facilitate the laying of culverts and pipes. Following that aspect, the superstructure will be erected, which will see the paving and asphalting of the affected spaces. Well, I know for a fact, because I want to make a clear distinction here, um, the sinkhole and the substructure, um, the cost for the project was in excess of $129 million. Um, when the substructure is completed, then we will move to the superstructure area which entails the asphalting and the um, paving of that area. So I guess we will have an additional cost associated. So that I don't have at this point in time. The roundabout will enable drivers to travel to their desired destination with reduced traffic congestion coming from the East Coast Samarara and Kitty environs. The Ministry of Public Infrastructure commits to provide technical and financial assistance to neighborhood democratic councils to rectify the aging infrastructure. This follows the breaches of several sluices and communities along the west coast of Demerara. Nishan Volms Kerlinius files this report. Commenting on the recently breached coca at Wallam West Coast de Marara, Minister within the Ministry of Public Infrastructure, Annette Ferguson, related that the situation was brought under control with the assistance of the National Drainage and Irrigation Authority, Guy Suku, and the Neighborhood Democratic Council. The minister expressed, though the Public Infrastructure Ministry is responsible for addressing and providing advice on technical issues regarding national infrastructural projects, it is first and foremost the job of those governmental entities, the NDC, the NDIA and Guy Suko, to rectify any coca breach and clogged drains and canals of such communities nestled beside rivers and agricultural estates. Um, just to let you know that the Ministry, I have been advised that the Ministry of Public Infrastructure did receive a report of a coca um, breakage there in the Metamerzard um, area. But what was further reported is that the Ministry of Public Infrastructure has no responsibility for overseeing or fixing of the coca door in that area. It is the responsibility of NDIA and I was made to understand that it's also the Gaisuko um, responsibility. So all efforts on both entities, um, that's the NDIA and the um, Gaisuko personnel, they're currently addressing the situation. I need advice in, in, in terms of probably how the door should be structured or, you know, whatever in the line of uh, technical assistance the Ministry of Public Infrastructure would render. Because mind you, I just want to make it clear that NDIA and Daisuko, these two entities do have, you know, um, engineers within their remit. But sometimes you would have um, cases where, you know, you might need input from Ministry of um, public infrastructure and you know we do reach out to our brothers and sisters. On September 6, volumes of water rushed into the village of the Willem, sending many residents in that and surrounding communities into panic mode, afraid of severe flooding. When asked, in addition to technical support, whether the Public Infrastructure Ministry would in the future render any financial assistance to such communities prone to coca breaches and severe flooding, Minister Ferguson affirmed once the situation presents itself and poses a to people's safety, such assistance would be given. 
well, I guess you would have been seen in past times, you know, when we had situation of heavy rainfall, you know, we had it in 2015, we had some of it in 2016. I would have noticed that even though the Ministry of Public Infrastructure has no responsibility for coal cars here in the city, you know, it's under the, the um, main city council, we would have rendered the necessary assistance, you know, we ensure that pumps were made available if the coca doors need clearing we would have done likewise so our feet is always on the ground reporting for mtv news update lashona gomes crinolius the mayor and city council is asking for financial assistance from businesses along church street and north road to prevent the erosion and merman small from worsening currently the earth there is slowly declining into the church street canal here is janet sabrams The erosion of Merriman's Mall continues. This is despite the town clerk Royston King promised on July 26 to collect recommendations from the city engineer department within two weeks. However, it is over six weeks since King made that pronouncement, yet nothing to rectify the issue has been done. When contacted again by News Update, King said that the engineers are looking at works which can be done to save the mall. I believe they're looking at doing some revetment work along the canals um, on the north and on the south uh, to save that particular stretch of land that is called the Merrimons Mall. The town clerk said that the study of the erosion and the ramifications will cost the council a fortune. He is therefore seeking financial assistance from businesses along Church Street and North Road. Uh, it will require massive resources and we are hoping to have arrangements with the businesses that are operating uh, along North Road and along Church Street to see if they can help and if we can salvage that, um, that erosion. Meanwhile, King was proud to announce that the council has paid some of his debt to the contractor of the presidential park. We have paid them partially. We have paid uh, the contractor who did work on the presidential park partially. We still have outstanding amounts for him. According to King, the city council has been cash-strapped for some time and is constantly in debt. Reporting for MTV's News Updates, I am Yanis Abrams. The individual who was accused of injuring Trinidad Socrates Benjai was placed on $50,000 bail. The Trinidad Socrates was also present in court. Nika Jonu filed this report. 25-year-old Maverick Diabro was placed on $50,000 bail when he appeared before Magistrate Fabio Zor. Diabro pled not guilty to the charge which alleged that he maliciously wounded Rodney Benjai LeBlanc on April 16, 2017. Benjai came from neighboring Trinidad after he was able to secure attorney Yuzi Anderson to represent him in court on April 16. LeBlanc claims that he was wounded by Diabro while at Palm Court. LeBlanc, who had just finished headline a soccer party at the night spot, was in the company of his entourage outside Palm Court. It was during that time the driver of a car which was parked at the night spot's entrance began to drive off when LeBlanc hit the vehicle to notify the driver that he was too close to the group. The court was told that the driver stepped out of the vehicle and began to use expletives at LeBlanc and also threatened him with a gun. The court was further told. During that time, another individual came out from the same vehicle and threw an object at Benjai's group. The object smashed across the Soka RT's face. He was rushed to the Woodlands Hospital where he underwent an emergency corrective surgery. The Soka RT's had 15 stitches to his right jaw. The accused, Diabro, who was placed on $50,000 bail, will return to court on October 11, 2017. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Minister of Foreign Affairs Carl Grenit says Guyana is preparing to have the border controversy between Venezuela brought before the International Court of Justice. He says the good offices process that was initiated one year ago is not making any progress. Find out more in this report. Minister of Foreign Affairs Carl Greenwich said the government will not be in favor of having another extension of the United Nations Good Offices process. Minister Greenwich noted that it has been over a year now 
since former Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, made the decision to extend that process. Well, we, we um, as good planners, you have to look forward and anticipate all possible outcomes. Minister Greenwich said President David Granger will be meeting with the new Secretary General of the United Nations on the sidelines of the 72nd session of the UN General Assembly. The meeting is scheduled for September 25, 2017 in New York. Minister Greenwich said Guyana is preparing should the matter be placed before the International Court of Justice. We have been doing work domestically and uh, putting together teams that can undertake that work. Venezuela has not recognized the 1899 Arbitral Award, which entitled Guyana to the Essequibo region. The issue has been brought to the forefront when U.S. oil giant ExxonMobil discovered high-quality hydrocarbons off Guyana's coast in the Starbrook block. The discovery was made in May 2015, just before the coalition government took office in that year. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Following speculations on the sale of petroleum licenses, the People's Progressive Party is advising the government to facilitate auctions instead of a random sale. This comes as Guyana gears to start commercial production of oil in 2020. General Secretary of the People's Progressive Party, Bara Jaglu, believes the alleged random sale of petroleum licenses is not the way to go. According to him, an auction should instead be done for sale of the blocks. Those licenses will give companies permission to search for commercially feasible deposits for the extraction of petroleum off the Starbrook block. He says random sale of those blocks will allow companies to benefit more than Guyana by reselling it at a much higher price. So, they will get these blocks and weeks later, they will sell the blocks without any competitive process being followed because now there is no competitive process for awarding the blocks. They will get them and then sell them on words. Jardy also claimed at least two persons in close affiliation with the present regime has applied to purchase those blocks. That a number of front companies with key APNU AFC individuals and ministers and their, in, and their families as shareholders have submitted applications to the Ministry of um, Natural Resources for a petroleum exploration and production license. While there has been mounting calls for the opposition and stakeholders for the disclosure of the oil contract, the government has remained steadfast on its decision. In 2015, oil giant ExxonMobil made the first significant discovery of quality oil-bearing sandstones off through Guyana. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. The CARICOM Secretariat had organized a response mechanism before Hurricane Irma battered the Caribbean islands with the strong winds and torrential rains. The powerful storm has left more than a dozen people dead and billions of dollars in damages. Nikhil Jondu with the details. Assistant Secretary General of CARICOM, Douglas Slater, during an interview said, prior to Hurricane Irma unleashing its strong winds and torrential rains on the Caribbean, CARICOM had been working to address the situation. He noted that the CARICOM Secretariat has collaborated with the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency to address the impact and damages of the aftermath. Our Secretary General actually had a tour of the, um, the countries affected and uh, so we are working together with regional governments, international development partners and organizations to the best we can, to do the best we can to alleviate the, the suffering of our citizens. The Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency on its website says, Hurricane Irma, the ninth named hurricane of the 2017 hurricane season, became a Category 5 hurricane in the Eastern Atlantic Ocean on Tuesday, September 5. 
with maximum sustained winds near 185 miles per hour, Irma, a powerful Category 5 blast the states of Anguilla, Antigua and Barbuda, St. Martin, St. Barthelme, British Virgin Islands, Dominica, St. Kitts and Nevis, and Montserrat over Tuesday night into Wednesday evening, September 6. The hurricane continued its destructive path and impacted Turks and Caicos Islands and the northern border of Haiti. And then on Friday, September 7, the southeastern islands of the Bahamas were impacted. The hurricane has left 25 persons dead in the Caribbean, according to the New York Times. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. President David Granger has pardoned five female inmates of the New Opportunity Corps. Their release will be effective on September 15. Find out more in this report. Minister of Social Protection Amna Ali has announced that five females from the New Opportunity Corps will be released on September 15, 2017. Minister Ali said the decision was taken by President David Granger. The five females are between the ages of 13 and 16. Minister Ali encouraged them to keep on the right path. The young ladies in turn thanked Minister Ali and asked her to convey their appreciation to the head of state. On Wednesday, September 13, Minister Ali visited the New Opportunity Corps and met with the staffers. In light of the recent escape at the institution, where 11 juveniles eluded the authorities, the need to heighten security was addressed. Efforts are being made to rectify those breaches in the shortest possible time. Structural improvements to the facility was another matter which was highlighted with construction and renovations to commence before the end of 2017. Staff members present at the meeting indicated that the implementation of additional staff would alleviate the challenges which the NOC presently faces. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. 15 lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender activists were charged to become potential champions of change in confronting challenges at the inaugural LGBT Leadership Academy. Here's more. The LGBT Leadership Academy has been launched to strengthen LGBT leadership in the Caribbean by conducting two tailored training in Guyana and Suriname. The Academy will see 15 LGBT activists from six Caribbean territories trained to strengthen and sustain leadership in their home countries. Assistant Secretary General for Human and Social Development, CARICOM, Douglas Slater, charged activists to remain optimistic. He said this trait is necessary as there is always prejudice against the LGBT community. Slater also urged them to practice teamwork to sustain leadership to effect the necessary changes desired. In order to get change, we have to be diligent, we have to work very hard and confront many challenges. And I can't reiterate more the challenges that organizations like yours have. Noting that leadership will strengthen human rights in the Caribbean, Managing Director of Sasa Joel Simpson said more voices are required to boost LGBT rights. And I hope that this academy inspires you to, after leaving here, to recognize that I need to go back home and think who else within my organization needs to be similarly capacitated and what can I share and do. A breakdown in the supervision of prisoners at the Masaruni prison farm has resulted in the escape of an inmate. The escape is being pursued by a search party after he went missing on Wednesday, September 13. Nickel John with the details. The Guyana Police Force has been called in to recapture Vijay Sanchara, who escaped from the Masaruni prison farm. Acting Director of Prisons Gladwin Samuels said, based on intelligence, Sanchara was given a drop by a tractor driver, which indicate that he is heading back home. Samuels stated the escapee hails from the Essequibo coast. The prison's director has asked the police to investigate the reason why the prisoners were not adequately supervised, resulting in the escape. He pointed out that there may have been a breakdown in the supervision along the way. 31-year-old Vijay Sanchara remains on the run up to press time. He was incarcerated for wounding with intent and is serving a seven-year jail term. Nikhil Jondo reporting for MTV News Update. 
The escapee was later caught on Thursday, September 14, at Gold Creek. The reports which say that Wendell Blanham has been kicked out of the Criminal Investigation Department and was replaced by Senior Superintendent for Avenger at Woodram is false. The Ghana Police Force has denounced the articles, leaving them as mischievous. The Guyana Police Force says that the crime chief Wendell Blanham was not kicked out of the Criminal Investigation Department as reported on social media. The force in a statement said that Detective Blanham, who had previously requested a short period of annual vacation leave, was afforded such since it was well deserved. The force noted that Detective Superintendent Ravindra Dat Budram was temporarily placed as crime chief since Detective Superintendent Joel David was on a special assignment. However, Budram's assignment has come to an end and Assistant Commissioner Paul Williams is now the crime chief acting until Detective Blanham returns. Senior officers will have to resume duty in time for the commencement of the police's Christmas period, a period where the intensification of operational and preventative law enforcement strategies are paramount. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius. That's a wrap for MTV's News Updates Weekend Review. The newscast can be viewed online on MTV's Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel. Join us Monday, September 18 at 7 hours 30 for another edition of MTV's News Update. On behalf of our news team, I'm Sandy Ramutar, thanking you for watching. Have a good night.